Okay, and voila. Okay, new iPad, new whiteboard. Um, so it looks like, shoot, what happened, sorry. Okay, normal whiteboard. Um, okay, so we, so first of all, remember last time there was a sign issue. If you remember a sign issue, um, can we just use the running backdrop? And so I know what I thought. Um, but it turned out to be more, more complicated than I thought. So I'll, I'll send you guys a write-up if you're interested. It's actually more subtle than I had thought. And so what are we going to do today? So today we're going to talk about reinforcement learning. So today... Reinforcement learning. Also known as RL. And I'm gonna do a couple things. Um, so first of all, um, so I'm gonna define the problem. We've already done that. Although I've mentioned So that's mainly done, but I'll give a little recap. I'll talk about what's called the TD error, TD temporal difference. And that's actually a very useful signal for learning, and it's one that humans use a lot. Um, then I'll talk about, so RL is a huge field, and there are tons and tons of algorithms for learning. I'm going to talk about a few algorithms for learning. Algorithms. Um, for those of you who know, Q learning. Policy gradient. And model based methods. And then I'll talk about a specific example. So integrating evidence over time. So one of the things that, one of the decisions you make all the time is when to stay with a task and when to switch, when to switch and do something else. And typically what happens is early in the task, you get information, um, the probability of future rewards goes up. Um, but after a while, things get depleted. So a classic example is you go to a restaurant, you want to decide what to eat. Uh, if you spend more time in that menu, you'll probably do a better job, especially with large menus, but there's a trade-off in time. You can't spend forever looking at the menu. Same thing with a marriage problem. Um, you spend a certain amount of time looking for someone to marry, but you don't spend forever uh, for obvious, for lots of reasons. Um, and if there's time, I'll talk about a neuroscience example. Uh, 
Sorry, first time. Okay. So that's it for today. Um, that's what I'll be up to. Um, so remember, we saw last time that an RL So we have states, which we almost pretty much always use S actions, A, and a policy, which is a mapping um, often called pi of A given S, or sometimes P pi of A given S, or sometimes just P of A given S. So given a state, um, what action do you take? So we write it as probabilities, um, but it can be deterministic. It could be, you know, given a state, there's only one action you, you make. And in fact, it's often deterministic, although there are reasons for it to be not to be term deterministic. Um, the reason for that to be a little bit stochastic. So we draw states, we draw states like this, we just think of them as you know S1, S2. Oh, sorry, there's one more thing, very important, and the rewards. And rewards is basically what you get. I'll draw it. So I call this R, R of S to S prime. It's what you get when you go from state state S to S prime. And that also can be a probabilistic. Rewards are, are rarely um, rewards are rarely deterministic. You rarely know exactly what you're going to get. Okay, so that's the setup. So those are the things that that RL people deal with. And the states we just write like this. So when you go from state one to state two, you'll get R um, S one to S two. And again, that can be stochastic. S3, um, you get R, S2 to S3, and maybe you can go backwards, R, S3 to S2. So those are the rewards you can collect. And what, so the key observation in reinforcement learning is that you can assign a value to every state. value uh, to every state. Call it V of S. And the value equals expected future reward. Okay, a, sta a state has high value um, if it's going to give you lots of reward, it's got low value if it doesn't. And of course, um, value, it's very important that value depends on policy. Okay, it depends what action you take. Um, if you, I mean, let's say you have two choices, you can go this way or this way, or S1 to S3. Okay, so if your policy is to go in this direction versus that direction, you'll get different rewards. Um, if you're in the future, so whatever your policy is, it's gonna determine your rewards. And your policy can be never leave this well. Um, so if your policy is just to go S3, I mean, and of course this is, is this can go on forever, um, but your policy in general determines, depends on what you do next. So it's entirely sensible. And so what does RL do? RL 
basically the goal of RL, um, the goal is to maximize, choose the policy, the policy that maximizes So basically maximize expected future rewards. Okay. And these are actually, we should include discounted. Okay, rewards in the future are not worth as much now. Makes entire sense, right? If I give you a minute, say you can have a, a million won, a million pounds, or whatever, in, in 10 years or in 100 years, right? You're not even going to care. You won't be alive. Um, and the same thing. Money now is, is worth more than money later on. Um, and so RL consists of a huge number of different algorithms and methods for achieving this. Um, and you know, some work well in some situations, some work well in others. And what's interesting is some of these algorithms can be mapped onto human behavior. And in fact, RL was one of the big success stories in theoretical neuroscience. Um, it actually made predictions that, that people saw in the brain. And I'll show you some of those pretty soon. So the main observation that allows us to do math It's going to lead to something called Bellman's equation. So it will give us Bellman's equation. Is this. So the value of a state, I'm going to take the really simple case where things are deterministic. There's always going to be under some policy. Okay, and the policy term depends on future space. This is R, S, S prime. The reward you get to when you go to set prime plus gamma, R, S prime to S double prime. So this is our discount factor. It's usually close to one. So maybe, so maybe on the order of 0 0.99 would be kind of a discount factor near one. And so in that case, you know, this is, there's not much discount. This is worth 99% of the reward if you ask you what it would be worth on, on the, um, any given trial, but have few, but once you go on the order of hundred times steps into the future, rewards are worth less in this case, um, for instance. So for example, but it could be smaller, right? Um, in fact, small children have discount factors that are very small. They don't care at all about the future, only about the present. Plus gamma squared, R, S prime to S double prime, double prime to S triple prime, plus dot, dot, dot. And the nice thing is we can write this as equals, equals R of S, goes to S prime plus gamma R of S prime goes to S double prime plus gamma R of S double prime to S triple prime plus dot, dot, dot. And this is nice because you recognize this as the value of state S prime. Okay, so um, in this simple version where everything was deterministic, we knew exactly what's going on. We can write V, this is again under some policy. And we'll see this play out the role of the policy explicitly soon. So V pi of S equals R S to S prime 
plus gamma V pi of S prime, okay? And this actually makes a lot of sense, right? If the value, let's take an example, let's say the value of this is, is 100. So V equals 100. And then um, the reward is 20. The value of this state is only V equals 80, right? You've got your reward, so the, the next state is necessarily less valuable. Um, Okay, now this, uh, this is, of course, computing these values self-consistently is no easy task, but if this was the case, kind of makes sense, right? Um, as you, if you do something rewarding, the next state is not as gonna be as rewarding. Um, okay, so let's actually, we can also look at the sort of the, um, the more technical, but slightly harder to follow, version, which is, which is the correct version, which is that V pi, the true story is V pi of S equals a sum on S prime. The probability of going to S to S prime under some policy pi times R of S reward you get when you go to S to S prime plus the value of the next state, which is just um, gamma times the sum on S double prime, P again under some policy of going to S prime, S double prime, and then we have R of S prime to S double prime, plus dot, dot, dot. And then you have a whole bunch of parentheses to close. But you'll recognize again that this quantity here um, this quantity here oops is just v of and the policy pi of um, s prime. So the true uh, story should be V pi of S equals a sum on S prime, probability under some policy of going from S to S prime. And the reward you get when you go from S to S prime plus gamma V pi of S prime, okay? So this is, this is Bellman's equation. And Bellman's equation, this is Bellman's equation for, for, for fixed policy. Sometimes you put, you know, max, over actions. In some, some sense, um, so you sort of, when you're state S prime, you choose the policy that maximizes uh, uh, you, you, the, the reward you collect and the value of the next, of the next state, okay? Um, and so this is kind of nice, right? We started with this sort of um, very abstract model. Our goal was to, um, maximize future discount and rewards. And we got ourselves down to one simple equation, which I'll write on the next page. So V pi of state S equals um, the sum on S prime, probability of going from S to S prime, R, of S, S prime plus gamma V pi of S prime. Okay. Um, 
and this is nice, right? Because now basically we have we have a way we could be basically all we have to do is choose our policy to make the the uh, values as large as possible. Okay, and and actually I'm going to separate this into uh, the sum on s prime p pi of s s prime r of s s prime plus gamma the sum on s prime p pi s to s prime times v pi of s prime. Okay, so this is this is, this is basically the expected reward. Reward. Okay, and the expected be reward has to be the difference between the value here and the value here. Values of the next states. Okay. Um, and so that's why the, the value drops, right? If, if you actually get a large reward, this has to, this thing has to be large and this has to be smaller. Um, so what, so, so this is, a, this is, you know, actually worked, worked out a policy. This has to be solved self-consistently, but what if you, um, so how do we find a policy? Okay. And let's say, let's ask the question differently. We're gonna assume, we're gonna pick a particular policy um, and then we're gonna to try to determine the value of the state. So one thing, I mean, the, the long-term goal, so the long-term goal is find optimal policy. But one approach is pick a policy find um, the values of each state find v of a s for all for all states and then you know modify a policy policy to increase value. Okay. And the other thing is sometimes we don't have a choice of the policy, right? But we do still want to, um, and we'll see examples of that um, in a second, but we still, even if we don't have um, control of the policy, we want to know the value. Okay, it's something the brain sort of does naturally. So imagine, so how would we find, you know, given a policy, how would we find, um, how might we find the value, okay? So this is sort of a simple, simple test. Let's say we're in state one, we're in state, we go to state two, um, okay? So let's say we go to state, let's say we start with, so we're gonna try to, for the, our goal, our sort of approach is gonna choose a set of values for every state, and then wander around state space and use what the rewards we see to update our values. Okay. So we're gonna just suppose we start off with V1, V of state one, sorry. V of state one equals zero. V of state two equals zero and a V of state three equals zero, okay? And for simplicity, I'll assume in what follows that gamma equals zero. So we'll take the gamma, I'm sorry, gamma equals one. There's no discount factor. So basically what happens is, um, so our really our model is V, if we take this sort of particular state, so what this tells us, I'm gonna write this as, so V pi of S. So what this tells us, we can kind of write very approximately as V of state S equals R S to S prime plus V of state S prime. 
Okay. And so our predicted, if you have some, if you think you know what the value of each state is, predicted reward equals V of S minus V of S prime. Okay. So you have in your mind some values, you can use that to predict the reward. And so our starting point was everybody has zero value. And now we go, that's how the reward you pick up is R equals 10. You go from this state. And you say, okay, our predicted reward was zero. I got a reward of 10. I should maybe, I should probably make this bigger. I mean, you can make it you know, really big, but, but typically what you do, so maybe you wanna set uh, implies V of S1 equals 10, okay? That might, might not be a good idea to learn very fast, especially in words stochastic, but it's something you might do. And you can wander around this space and every time you, know, you see ward, let's say R equals uh, minus four. So what you do is you set, um, that sort of sets this value, um, set V of S2 equals minus four. Okay, so that actually, the problem of course is that explains this, but now um, this 10 was too high because now you're expecting a 14. Um, but, but, that's, but the main idea is you wander around state space and you find these values consistently. Okay, it's a very easy idea and we can formalize it. We're gonna write again in the simple case, V, So we just write, you know, very this this simplified version. So V is state S equals R S to S prime. I'll put the gamma back in. Gamma V of S prime. So predicted reward R predicted. equals V of S minus gamma V of S prime. And the RP to reward prediction error, off, it's called the RPE um, equals the actual reward S to S prime minus predict reward, which is the difference between the two states minus gamma V of S prime. About as simple as you can get, okay? And in the old days, RPE, so positive RPE, makes you happy. And what I should point out, so this, use, this is something you always carry around in your brain, right? You carry around a prediction of um, reward. And if, it's, if the reward exceeds your prediction, you're happy. If it's negative RPE, The negative RPE, RPE, you're not happy. And that turns out to have rather profound implications. It's a really, really simple idea. Um, it explains a lot of behavior. It's actually really useful for organizing um, what you do. And so what one can do is use the RPE to update your values. So um, you wander around your state space and your update rule is um, delta V, your change in value in state S equals some learning rate times RPE, which is R of S to S prime. Um, 
minus V of S minus gamma V of S prime. Okay. And the RPE is associated with dopamine. Okay. Whenever the RPE is positive, you get a shot of dopamine, um, at least in the simple version of, of RL or simple version of behavior, you get a shot of dopamine and you're happy. You get negative reward, you get a shot of dopamine and you're unhappy. And a lot of your life um, focuses around getting um, lots of dopamine. Um, and in fact, uh, rats, if given a choice between dopamine and eating, well, if they're, they're allowed to press a lever that artificially injects dopamine into their brain, they'll press a lever until they die. So it's a very, very powerful motivator. Um, not surprising, it's a little bit hard to get. Um, and that's what drugs bypass. Drugs bypass um, sort of this, the, the brain is set up to make it hard to deliver dopamine. You can bypass that with drugs, um, which is why people like them. Okay, I'm gonna give you actually sort of a classic, talk about a classic experiment. Um, it was done a long time ago. This was, um, so the answer is very Schultz. Diane. Montague. So Peter, Diane, and Reed Montague were actually postdocs at the time. This came out in Science in 1976. So if you Google Schultz, Diane, Montague in Science 1976, you'll see the paper. Um, it's probably going to get at least some of these people a Nobel Prize. Um, it's a pretty cool experiment. So here's the experiment. So basically, what, the reason I'm telling you about this is I want to emphasize that, that, you know, this is kind of, this is now, this is a very abstract theoretical, um, the dopamine is sort of abstract theoretical ideas. And what we want to show is that you actually, the dopamine signal in the brain really depends on this quantity. Okay, at least in this simple experiment. Turns out it's more complicated in other experiments, but in this experiment, at least it works. So here's the experiment. So you have a monkey, in this case it's a monkey, they've now done the experiments in mice and rats. Um, so gets what's called a CS, a conditional, conditional stimulus, which is basically a tone. Could be, so just a beep, okay? And a few seconds later, I forget how many seconds later, I think two seconds later, let me find out. About, yeah, about a little over one second later. Um, about one second later. Gets a reward, a juice reward. Okay. And um, what they looked at, so measured, dopamine response. Okay, so a simple experiment. And what I'm gonna show you is the dopamine response um, versus time. So this is a time of the tone, the CS, and the reward here. Um, so this is this is often called the U.S. Um, phrases I'm not happy with because it's pretty much jargon. So this is this is um, so this is what I'm going to plot is dopamine response here. Response and basically here dopamine response is firing rate. of dopamine neurons. Okay. 
okay? And what they found is initially, so in early trials, right, the animal had no idea what the tone meant. So the dopamine signal was, you know, this is firing rates was maybe a few hertz going along, going along. And then when they got the reward, they got a shot at dopamine. Okay. That's been known for a long time, um, even before 1976. So this was trial one. So um, they didn't show the intermediate trials, but since then I think they've done this experiment. So after a few trials, um, I don't know, 10, 20, 50 trials, after a few trials, they actually got, the tone gave them a little shot of dopamine and a little shot here. And eventually, this is maybe trial 10, but eventually, let's say trial 100, um, they got a big response here and no response there. Okay, so this is crazy. They're getting juice reward and they don't, the dopamine neurons don't care. And that's because it's almost entirely predicted. This is short enough so they know they're gonna, if they got a tone, they know they're gonna get a reward about one second later. Um, and so they don't care anymore. They got happy because this was unpredicted. Right, the the time between between these these conditions stimulus stimuli was sort of variable and long enough so the animal couldn't predict it, so it got an unpredicted increase in future rewards. So dopamine, this is really important. Dopamine um, signals unpredicted. Uh, future rewards. Okay, that's pretty profound, right? You know, dopamine signal, if you predict if you predict the world, you'll never be happy. Well, you never get any shot of dopamine, right? It could be satisfying. Um, you predict the world, actually you make a lot of money and that's uh, maybe unpredicted, you get a shot of dopamine. But really it's, it's, it's unpredicted things to generate dopamine and the other thing, of course, is if you omit, um, let's say that you omit the reward, okay? So this in green, um, you get the usual shot of dopamine here, and now you get no reward here. Again, negative dopamine. The firing rate drops, and this is, um, oops. The, the, the firing rate of dopamine neuron drops, and the reason it drops is because this was unpredicted. Drop in future rewards. So this was, I mean, the reason this is, is Nobel, the probably get a Nobel Prize is it's really pretty rare that theorists come with some kind of theory, make predictions that's actually true. Um, and so this was, this was very, very, very nice combination of theoretical experimental work. And you can see, I'm gonna, um, you can see that why this set of equations, like I'll show you in a second, would lead to um, exactly what you saw, okay? And let's actually go through that, talk about, um, so we'll sort of have a simplified version. So this is, on this axis, we're gonna put time, we're gonna discretize time um, into bins. So each of these is a time bin. So we'll assume the reward comes here. And let's say the tone comes here. Okay, and we're gonna ask what happens to the value um, in this setup. So it's a little com more complicated than you might think because there are basically two states. There's a state where um, you've heard the tone and no tone. Okay, 
So if you're in the known tone regime, of course, you don't know what's going on. So basically predicted reward reward um, is approximately zero, right? And the reason it's approximately zero is um, because pretty much, you know, no matter what time it is, what the odds are, let's say there's a long time between each of these trials where you actually get a tone, um, the probability of hearing a tone is small. The probability of getting reward is small and it's about the same, okay? So the value, you know, the value of this state and the value of this state are about the same. Um, value of these two states is a little bit, there's a small difference because um, you have discounting, let's ignore discounting. So the value of these two states are the same, the predicted error, reward, reward predicted error is zero. Now, initially, um, so we're gonna write the value on this axis. So the value is, is basically constant. And no matter what you do, it stays constant. And, and as long as um, this tone is, un, the tone is unpredictable, and we'll say it's, you know, these are far enough apart, so the tone is very unpredictable. You don't hear it very often. Um, there's gonna be no change in value. It's gonna be, of course, it's really, value is really only at discrete times. Actually, let's, let's sort of be careful about discrete times. So we sort of discrete times, the value is gonna be the same every time. Okay. So we'll plot the same thing here in the tone state. Um, and let's say this is the initial value. So the fir very first trial, so initial value, so blue is initial, okay? And so what happens? Nothing, you know, you're sitting there, you get a tone, you have no idea what it means. Um, so you've gotten a tone. So down here, you know, you've gotten a tone. So now you're in the tone state, but you don't really know what the tone means, right? So nothing's happening in the value. And here you suddenly get a reward, right? Say, oh, this state was worth more than I thought. So it jumps up a little bit. So this is trial one. Okay. Um, And then on the next trial, the same thing happens. This is keep, gonna keep going up on multiple trials. And it, what happens is um, these start going up as well. So on trial two, kind of draw on trial two, this one's gonna go up. On trial three, this one's gonna go up. On trial four, that one's gonna go up. On trial five and trial six, okay? And so as, you know, as time goes on, eventually, the value is going to go up here and after a long time. So actually let's, let's make sure it's discrete. After a long time, the value is gonna be, oops, the value is just gonna be at some high value. Let's make those, let's make those green. So this is, so the value is after a long time. Okay. And that's because basically these values, remember you're getting no reward when you go from here to here. So the values have to be about the same with a discount factor of one, exactly the same. And you learn that eventually. And so what happens is um, once the value here is, the value here is some positive number, the value here is zero. So the predicted reward is this drop and you get that reward every time. So you don't care, there's, there's no dopamine signal, right? Here though, um, what happens is on these later trials is you go from here here and you see um, so v uh, so predicted reward uh, 
I hope let's get this right. Um, equals value um, in the no tone state. minus value in the um, tone state. And that's less than zero, okay? When you make that jump, it's less than zero. And so um, if the actual reward is zero, predictive reward, actual reward, equals zero. So the RPE, RPE equals positive. Okay. And you get a shot at dopamine. Um, and so this very simple model accounts for this. And also, it also explains why here, um, the value here minus value here is negative. So the value here minus value here is positive. You're expecting a reward. When you don't get one, the RP is negative, the, the dopamine neurons drop, okay? So this is a beautiful match between these experiments and, and, the, and this theory, okay? This really simple theory explains some otherwise very, experimental results that would have been pretty puzzling. You know, you'd say, well, well, the animal got juice, why didn't it care? It cared because it predicted it. And that is actually, a super important lesson if you ever have children. Never, ever, ever take your kids into a shop and then buy them something. Because what happens is when they get to the shop, they're gonna expect it, they get a shot at dopamine when they enter the shop. And if you don't buy them something, they'll get negative, <laughs> negative shot of dopamine and they'll start crying. Um, so, so it's actually really important to, to realize when people are happy. They're happy when they, they, when their expected future rewards go up. Um, okay, so I think I'm gonna take a break here. So that's sort of the, the experimental history of, um, well, little experiments and a little on the idea of these, these sort of simple ways to learn values. Um, I'm gonna talk in the next, um, next half of the, of the lecture is I'll talk about ways to improve your policy. Um, and then I'll give a specific example of coin flips. Okay, five minute break. Uh, feel free to ask questions. And I'll be back in five minutes. Okay, shoot. Uh, there we go. More chats. Okay, so the question is why do we add a prime in Bellman's equation? So let me go back to Bellman's equation. Um, so we can look at the one here. So S prime. Sorry, I should have been more clear about this. S prime is, oops. So S prime is just a future, is it S prime um, is shorthand for the next state. Short 
shorthand for the next date. Okay. So before we, we've written our states, you know, we, we sort of labeled our states S1, S2, but if you're in state S1, you don't know where you're gonna to go to next. It depends on your policy. So we just call that S prime. Um, that makes sense? And the same is, sorry, the same is true if we write down, uh, same thing is, is here true. So S prime again, um, this just basically means next date. Oh, sorry, the P, okay. Uh, the P is, sorry, I should have said, uh, sorry if I didn't say this. So P is, this is, a, so this quantity here is a probability of going from S to S prime. Okay, so you might wonder why things are probabilistic. Um, in fact, most of the time when we make an action, what happens um, is actually probabilistic. So for instance, classic example I was thinking of is, is let's say you, you're going to catch a bus um, and your policy is, let's say you leave at eight in the morning. If you leave at eight in the morning, there's a 90% chance of catching the bus. Um, let's say train, train's more regular. You're leaving to go to the train station. If you leave at eight o'clock, there's a 90% chance of, of catching the bus. So there's a 90% chance you'll be catching the train. 90% chance you'll be on the train and 10% chance you won't. So you don't really know what's gonna happen. You and you change your policy to leave at you know, 10 minutes to eight, then the probability of, of being on the bus is higher, otherwise it's lower. Okay, possibly overkill explanation, um, but it actually comes up a lot that things are probabilistic. Okay, so let's let's actually talk about sort of so we've so what we've all we've done so far is figured out how to compute the policy um, or compute the value given a policy. What we really want to know is how to choose a policy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a particular. There there are tons and tons of algorithms. Actor critic, PPO. There's deep RL now. There, there are just millions of ways to do this. But I'll talk about a classic one, which is actually not so far from what people probably do a lot is called Q learning. And Q depends on both state and action. And that equals expected future rewards, future rewards given state S and action A, okay? So for instance, let's say you're in state S, um, you can go to state, you know, you can go to state two, you can go to state one, okay? And so this is, so this is action equals, we'll call it action equals one, action equals two. And they have different values, right? So you can ask, you know, what's the value of the future? What are the future rewards if I go this direction first versus that direction? Okay. And you can see why this would be an incredibly useful thing, right? If you really knew, um, if you really knew the true value of these things, then that gives you automatic policy. So the policy, so if you knew, Q of S comma A, policy is choose, that, choose action with largest Q value. Okay. 
Okay. And now you can, so um, that's, remember there's a quarton qualifier if you knew Q of S given A. But you have to learn, you need to learn Q, right? So Q of S A is learned. And we could use the same TD air, right? So Q of, um, so we have again Q, we have sort of a Q value Bellman's equation, Q of X given A equals reward when you go to S to S prime. And then it, there's rewards of course determined by, you know, S prime is, is determined by by the action, right? So this reward depends on, put explicitly, is a function of the action as well, right? Well, actually that's probably a bad way to put it. The transition probability determined by the action, right? But what you really care about then is plus gamma, plus gamma, again, the value of state S prime, and the value, it could be the max, over A of Q of S comma A, depending on your policy. Okay, so you can still learn these Q values um, using the same method as before, um, but now, but what's critical is you don't actually ever know them perfectly, right? You have to wander around state space, you never know them perfectly, and therefore choosing the action with the largest Q value, um, that's a greedy policy, and it doesn't necessarily allow you to explore. Okay, so let's say you know you start off with you start off the game, you set all the Q values to zero, you make one transition, and you get a reward, it changes your Q value. Um, and and then you basically always keep doing that. You got a reward once you do it forever and ever and ever, you never explore. Okay. So you need a policy that explores. So Okay, so you need to not be greedy. And if you've ever wondered why teenagers have no prefrontal cortex and a shot full of hormones, it's because it ex presumably because it, it encourages exploration. Um, so you find out about the world. If you don't die, then you basically now um, do a much better job of choosing intelligent policies because you've, you've explored all sorts of potentially very bad ones. Okay, so one, so there are several ways. There's something called epsilon greedy is an easy one. So action equals the max over A of Q of S comma A with probability uh, one minus epsilon or random, random action with probability epsilon, okay? And you might wanna do something like early on when you know very little about environment, epsilon might be kind of high, so take a lot of random actions, but as you get, um, if you learn it um, more and more, you wanna turn epsilon down. It's actually a bad idea ever to turn epsilon to zero, even if you thought you knew something because the world changes, okay? Um, so you always wanna keep epsilon at some reasonable value. The other one is, the other popular one is softmax. So P of A equals E to the beta Q of um, S comma A, P of A, Right, this is P of A given S um, over the sum on A prime of E to the beta Q of S comma A prime. Okay, so this probability sums to one um, if you sum over, over the actions and as beta goes to infinity, it's deterministic. And beta goes to zero, it's random. 
And again, beta sort of corresponds, uh, maps this epsilon, right? Epsilon equals zero corresponds to beta equals infinity. Epsilon equals high corresponds to beta equals small. Um, and so this is, so beta is called inverse temperature. And so you can often tune the temperature again if you're very uncertain, you want beta to be kind of small. If you're pretty certain, you want it to be high. Okay. So this is actually, so this is, um, so this is something that, 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 that works on, on key values and, and values. The other thing you can do is, is basically directly policy gradient. So this is basically something that's, that's used a lot in deep learning literature, um, deep learning. Call it sometimes called key learning, called deep, deep RL. So parameterize the policy. P of um, A given S. So with a neural network. So these are the, would be the weights of the network. I don't know why people call it theta, became popular, right? So this is what people use for alpha do, they use it for Atari, um, they use parameters of policy and you can actually, you can take gradients. It's not so easy to figure out how, So every time you get a reward, you um, or don't get a reward, you can update update your policy, and eventually you converge. The problem with these methods is you don't get a reward very often. Um, these were basically Atari games were used for these. Um, you, an alpha alpha zero alpha go um, use these policy to um, basically parameterize the policy. So typically in deep networks, you parameterize. value as well. So V theta of S. So again, this is some complicated mapping from S to value and you learn um, the parameters to give you good values or maybe Q of theta, um, I think Q theta, this is more common. So you could, if you want, you can only use, you know, the network for Q, um, you combine, uh, that with, with learning a policy as well. Um, in most networks, you do both. And these things, the algorithms, because your feedback is so rare in a lot of these games, in chess or Go or, or even video games, video games, you get a little more feedback. Um, but it's the same problem that you guys have in real life. Um, you don't get rewards very often. I mean, you do get rewards. You want to have a really, really smart way of updating your Q values, your values, and your policy. Um, and so there's been a lot of effort basically tweaking algorithms to make these things better and better. And they're getting pretty good at it. Okay, so, I mean, these games games are, are the, um, so DeepRL is doing amazing stuff right now. You can train animals to walk, to wander around and do cool stuff. Um, and I wanna actually mention one more before we, we talk about specific example. Um, these were all, so these were basically, these are model free. So you have no model. So basically model free, we, we had no model of state transitions. Okay. But what that means is, you know, remember we have a bunch of states, S1, S2. And there under particular, um, under a particular policy, there's a transition probability from S2 to S1, okay? And the other thing to do in model-based methods, in model-based methods, to learn 
transition probabilities. And this obviously insanely useful, right? If you know, if you have model of the world, you can now run simulations. And so if reward changes, um, often the reward changes much more rapidly than the environment, you can now do that to update your policy. Um, and one thing, of course, is rewards change over time, right? When you're hungry, food is very valuable. When you're not hungry, it's um, not so valuable. And so if you had to have you know, a different state uh, for every degree of hunger, a different value for every degree of hunger it would be a nightmare. But if you keep track of, um, if you know how the world works, right? You know that when you're not hungry, you don't go to a restaurant. Um, then when you are hungry, you do. And so these model-based methods are very, very powerful. The problem, of course, is that it's hard to learn, right? Um, and what happens these days is sort of the, this, this sort of the model of the world. Nice thing though, the model of the world can be used, can be learned independent of rewards. Okay, there's something that, that animals and humans do a very good job doing. They actually have a very good knowledge of how the world works and they can use that to do planning. So this, this one we think of as model free, um, think of this as habits. So these are habits. And we all have them, right? We've learned, we just learned the value of something and it can be very hard to unlearn. Um, you'll find yourself doing something just out of habit that it really isn't a good idea anymore. And this one is where planning comes in. Which of course is harder, um, but it's one of the things that humans are very, very good at. Okay, so that's it for the general theory of RL. Um, let's go back to what we've done today, what we've done so far. Um, and really it's, it's, it's this, right? So we've looked at these models. Um, so recap, you know, problems depend on states, action, rewards, um, policies, talked about TD, temporal difference error, and learning, which is a very, very powerful paradigm understanding how animals get learned, to Q learning, gradient, um, policy gradient, model-based methods is very briefly, RL is a huge, huge field. You could spend years reading literature and still not be an expert. Um, but mainly, you know, the idea, once you, once you absorb the idea of states, actions, rewards, then policies, um, you'll understand that that's basically the main aspects. Okay. So I'm going to save these to photos. Let me, I'm going to kill the whiteboard. So let me double check they made it. Uh, looks like, uh-oh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I think they're out there. Yeah, okay, good. Um, yes, in fact, there are 10 of them, perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna stop share and switch gears. And I talk about um, a very simple um, problem that comes up a lot, and that is um, deciding when to decide. When to decide. Which may not seem like an RL problem, but, but in a second, um, turns out it is. But I'll give you a really simple case. So the coin flip problem. And by the way, the reason we choose this problem is, is one, it's sort of, it's kind of, it's one of the most understandable RL problems. And it's something that animals face all the time. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples in a second, but I'll start with the coin flip problem. And the coin flip problem is um, there are two coins. Coin one and coin two. 
And for coin one, probability of heads equals P1. And for coin two, the probability of heads equals P2. Okay, I pull a kind of coin from my, my pocket. So choose a random coin, choose a coin. I'm not gonna tell you which one. And let's, it makes it really easy. So for example, either bias coins, this was 0 0.6 and this was 0 0.1. So coin one in, the, in this example has a higher probability of being heads, but it doesn't really matter. The probabilities can be anything as long as they're different. I choose a coin, I start flipping it. And you decide and you tell me whether it's coin one or coin two. Coin one or coin two. Okay. And you get rewarded if correct. You get, um, let's say plus 10 points. If you're wrong, you get minus 10. Okay, and again, you know, this could be anything. So actually let's, let's write it as, you know, um, you, get, you get R plus and R minus. And for an example, um, so plus 10 and minus 10. So these are examples. Okay. And the question is, how many, how long should you should you wait before you give me an answer? Okay. And there are trade-offs, right? The longer you wait, the more likely you are to be correct. To be correct. But the lower your average reward. But the longer you wait, the lower the average reward. So these are the trade-offs. And the trade-offs will be faced all the time in making these decisions. You gather more evidence and you're more likely to be right. Um, or do you wait longer and get and or you make a decision now and risk being wrong? Okay. And so what we want to do is formalize it. So this is in some sense your policy is a mapping from a state which is basically coin, previous coins that you've seen to action. And the action could be collect more coins or wait. So the actions are really simple. Okay, but as you can see, they lead to probabilistic outcomes, right? Make a decision, there's some probability of reward um, and waiting, you might get you know, coin that's helpful, you might not get a coin that's helpful. Okay, so let's formalize this. And the first thing we need to compute, so what do we need to solve the problem? solve the problem is the probability of coin one, coin one given flips. Actually, I'm gonna call this, uh, let's call this um, X from one to T. So you've seen T coin flips, so X, X i or X, I'm gonna call this one to capital T. So X T equals heads or tails. T 
So you see their heads or tails, you want to know the probability of this, of this. So this is what you care about, right? That's going to give you a lot of information. Um, and so we can use, right, but using Bayes' theorem, that's P of C1 given X1 to T equals P of X1 to T given C1, P of C1 over the probability of our data, P of X1 to T. And that is equal to P of X1 to T. I should write this a little more carefully. Um, times P of C1 plus P of X1, oops. P of C1 divided by probably able to get a data is probably, there are two ways to get a data. It's a probability of X1 to T, um, given C1, P of C1. Um, P of C1 plus the probability of uh, X1 to T, to T given C2, P of C2. And we can basically, in some sense, what we really care about, we can take the law dots, right? So P of, P of C1 given X1 to T divided by P of C2 given X1 T. So for this probability, we just put C2 in there, the denominator cancels, and we can write this as um, P of X1 to T given C1, P of C1 over P of X1 to T given C2, P of C2, okay? So this ratio, we call the log probability ratio, is all we need to compute. And if we know that, we basically know the probability that we're gonna get to be right. As we'll see, that's not totally enough to do the problem. Um, it's obviously, it's gonna depend on all sorts of things like the reward probabilities. And, and so it, it's gonna be kind of complicated, um, but that should be enough to get us started. So what I'm gonna do is, is basically now, um, the coins are independent, so this is kind of easy to compute. Um, so, P of C1 given X1 to T over P of C2 given X1. Um, remember is basically the product T equals one to T, P of X1 given coin one, given XT given coin one um, over product t equals one to t, p of x uh, t given c2, and then times p of c1 times the priors over p of c2. Okay, it's useful to take a log of this. So the log probability ratio, then whenever you have probabilities, one should always take logs, log p of c1 given x1, T over P of C2 given X1 to T equals, now the sum on T equals one to T of log P actually, well, actually let's not do this yet. There's sort of an easier way to do this, okay? So X1 is in this, in this, um, in this expression here, xt is either heads or tails, okay? And we can say, okay, this is really just equals um, probability of heads given c1 to the number of heads times probability of tails given c1 times the number of tails over 
the probability of heads given C2 times the number of heads times the probability of tails given C2 times the number of tails. And then again, we have P of C1 over P of C2. Um, and P of heads given C1, if you remember, is just P1. So probably heads given C coin one is P1, and that's P2. So we write this as, um, so this equals P1, it's the number of heads, times probably tails is one minus P1, the number of tails, over P2, the number of heads, one minus P2, the number of tails, times P of C1 over P of C2. Okay. Now, now we're gonna take the logs. We'll take the log of P of C1 given X1, P over P of C2 given X1, T. That equals NH, number of heads, times log at P1 over P2, plus number of tails, times log one minus P1 over one minus P2, plus log P of C1 over P of C2, okay? So this is kind of nice because we want to know the probability at this, you know, the log probability ratio, we just keep, have to keep track of the number of heads and the number of tails. Um, and so a strategy that one might use in this case um, is basically just keep track of this quantity. If it exceeds a threshold, let's say P1 is greater than P2, we'll just assume that P1 um, is greater than P2. If it exceeds a threshold, we make a decision. Okay, so basically we set things up like this on this axis, we plot um, number of heads times log P1 over P2 plus number of tails times log one minus P1 over one minus P2, okay? And our starting point, um, our starting point should be the prior, log of the prior, okay? So we start counting. Um, so our initial, initial starting point would be right here. So this point here is log the prior probability of coin one over the prior probability of coin two. Okay. And, and we're going to assume that P1 is greater than P2. And if that happens, every time we get ahead, let's say, if we get, so if we get ahead, we go up. And then if we get a tail, we get ahead, we go up. If we get a tail, we go down. Okay, we get a couple of heads in a row, a couple of tails in a row, and sort of keep track of this. And our policy is really nothing more than some kind of bound. This is our policy. It's a bound. We don't know what they look like. Um, it turns out for two coins, they're flat. And when we hit a bound, make a decision. Let's say, say coin one, okay? Or if on a different trial, you know, we start off, start off down, over, up, over, down, over, down, up, down, down, up, it takes longer. So coin two, okay? And these are called diffusion to bound models. It's diffusion to bound models. Okay. Um, actually, that what's well, diffusion bound models? Actually, they're called sorry. Not called diffusion bound models. They're called drift diffusion models. Uh, 
also known as DDM. Everything in this field has initials. Um, and the reason they're called drift diffusion is because basically there's some, you know, given a coin, there's gonna be some, some average drift, the, given by the average value of this, this quantity, it could be positive or negative, but on top of that drift, there's gonna be some random noise. And the random noise, of course, makes a hard, or hard R, okay, random noise down. Um, but the really nice thing about these models is that you can update it online, right? Every time you get ahead, you jump up once by a fixed amount. Every time you get a tail, you jump down, okay? And then the RL problem is to find a policy. So the policy is just, you know, you're, you now have two actions. So the policy consists of two actions. Consists of two actions. So wait or decide, okay? And now where you set the bounds is super important, right? If you set the bounds down here, you'll make a decision very early, right? Um, but uh, you won't be very accurate. If you set the bounds really high, you'd be super accurate, but you wait a long time. And now we see that the, the reward structure is super important, right? Um, remember your, let's say your R plus for a correct, R minus for incorrect. Um, sorry, let me quickly get to kind of important. Okay. Um, the reward structure is really important, right? Um, if so, for instance, if, let's go back to our picture. Um, so if R plus, or if R, you know, R plus equals 10, and R minus equal to 1,000. If you lose 1,000 for making a wrong mistake, you're gonna set the bounds really high, right? You're, gonna, you're not gonna make a mistake. On the other hand, so this is a case where high bounds, on the other hand, if R plus um, equals 10 and R minus equals um, let's say R minus actually we need a minus sign here. R minus equals nine, right? So if you're correct, you get 10. If you get wrong, you get nine. So you want to, for this case, you want to probably do low bounds. There's not a big cost to make a mistake. Okay. So that seems kind of reasonable. Um, now for the, for the two coin problem, it's not totally obvious, but it's reasonable that you have a flat bound. If you have more than two coins, it's very obvious that you shouldn't have a flat bound. And this is a reason. Let's say you have you know, lots of coins. And basically um, your task is, is probability of heads, P heads, greater than 0 0.5 or less than 0 0.5. Okay. Um, and for this task, now we can actually, let's, let's compute now the probability of, let's say our data X1 to T given coin N. Okay. That equals the probability of coin N Coin and given x1 to t, p of coin n, divided by the data, p of x1. Now this is the same for every coin, so we don't really, it's just a normalizer. Um, the same for every coin, right? So we don't really care so much what it is. Um, this is what we wanna focus on. And the, so the top thing, so we're just gonna say, we're gonna ignore that and say it's proportional to um, P, oops, got base there wrong. X1 to T given coin N. This is, um, this is P of coin, 
coin n equals heads to the number of heads um, times p of coin n equals tails times the number of tails times p of cn. And what's critical is it depends only on two quantities, the number of heads and the number of tails, okay? And so these should be, these tell you all the information you need. They should be enough to allow you to make a decision. Okay, so, and so what we can do, so what we know we can do um, is plot on this axis, number of heads minus the number of tails. And on this axis, uh, uh, n equals nh plus nt. Um, and so we start here and basically now um, there are lots of coins, right? We wanna really know whether this is gonna be positive or negative. So, you know, it goes up, it, um, it might come down, it goes up every time you get a coin, it goes up or down. Um, and now let's say that we use, um, let's put them in yellow because we're gonna drop them. So why would flat bounds be a bad idea? Okay. And the reason is, let's say that, that um, remember we have lots of coins. Let's say in one of these trials, um, you know, you went like this, down, up, you didn't get anywhere, right? You drift up a little bit. Um, it's likely that probably this coin is near a half and the chance of, of making correct decision is really small. So once you get to this point, you know, so you basically what you really want the bounds to do is go something like this. Okay. You know, if you haven't made a decision, if you don't have enough evidence after a long time, you might as well make a decision. Okay. So you, you um, so when there are lots of possibilities, you want a collapsing bound. And you know that, and actually, if you work out the math, which is completely non-trivial, it's no closed form expression for the optimal policy. Um, if you find that it is a collapsing bound, and this is has real world application. So this is the famous marriage problem. So this is evidence. So let's say you're dating somebody. Evidence that they're going to make a good spouse, and things you know go up or down, right? They you know you start here. They buy you dinner, buy you flowers, um, do something else nice for you, leave their socks on the, on the floor, it goes down. Um, and at some point you wanna basically, you gotta make a decision, right? If you wait too long, they'll leave you. If you put the bounds like that, um, you know, so they cheat on you, sleep with your, you know, if they sleep with your, your friend, it goes down to there and you reject them. Um, but suppose that didn't happen. Suppose nothing happened and you're wandering around um, like this. You kind of want it, you want collapsing bounds, right? If you haven't had enough evidence, um, even if you're even if you're going up, right? If you don't, oops. If you don't have enough evidence after a long time, um, well, you should probably um, you actually want the upper bound probably to go. Oops, go up. Okay, the lower bound you wanna, um, oops. You want the lower bound probably to go like this. Okay, and the idea is if you haven't reached, you know, come to the decision in a long time, you should probably um, not get married. Whereas this bound goes like this, because you're looking for, um, what you're looking for is something like this. Oops. It goes up fairly rapidly. Um, and this is something you do unconsciously all the time. You do it for a marriage problem, you do it for looking for apartments, you do it for um, deciding how long to study or watch a movie. So you have in your brain a model like this. So you're running R all the time unconsciously. Um, and so we're a little bit out of time or I could talk about, um, there's been a lot of neuroscience experiments in this domain. Okay. So that's pretty much it. We're out of time. Um, I'll stay on for a few minutes if you guys have any questions. Um, it was nice lecturing. It would have been nice if I could have come in person. And I hope you got something out of it at least.
Okay, so I'll stay on for a little while if you have any questions. Um, other than that, uh, this is goodbye. <laughs>